Our next conversation today is with the CEO of Denver Health, Donna Lynn. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Kyle. Great to see you again. So Denver Health is a safety net hospital. Explain what makes it different from other hospital systems. Sure. Well, as a safety net, um, the majority of our patients are either on Medicaid, so for people who are indigent in some way, or they may have no insurance at all. Um, so right now, 51% of our patients are on Medicaid, and we have another 15 to 16% who are completely uninsured. So that makes us very unique. We don't have a large base of commercial patients, perhaps like you and I, who have an insurance card. Um, many of them not only have no coverage, but they often delay care, and so they come to us in a way that we've got to provide a lot of care uh, to deal with some of their underlying health conditions. There might be a public perception that if you spend a dollar on that care, the government will give you a dollar to cover that care. How does it actually work? That's a great point. In fact, if we spend a dollar on care, we get about 85 cents on that dollar. So we have to make that up some way. And most hospitals make it up by having a pretty large commercial or employed base. We don't have that. So we can't cost shift to make up that care. So we have to raise money. We sometimes have to you know, scrimp in other ways. We can't always maintain our buildings the way we'd like to. And so when you have some of the challenges that the city of Denver's having now, whether it's around the unhoused or migrants, it just exacerbates an underlying problem that we have. How much of Denver Health's current financial difficulties, you described it as being at a critical point, how much of those difficulties are due to the migrant crisis and the increasing homeless population in the city? So we're just beginning to tally all the migrant numbers. Um, we've seen 8,000 migrants in the last 14 months for about 20,000 individual visits. Um, it's at minimum, in a conservative basis, it's probably about a $10 million number. Again, limiting um, who we're defining. You know, we don't ask you, are you a migrant? But we can make some assumptions based on never being seen by us and what countries they're coming from. Um, the unhoused population, of course, is a little bit more endemic. Uh, we see about 20% of our patients who come into the hospital, about 20% of them are unhoused. Here's the dilemma that we have. If you're unhoused and you have frostbite, and we treat your frostbite, we have to make a decision. Do we discharge you when the acute incident is taken care of, only to know that you're going to be back out on the street, perhaps on 6th and Broadway? to get more frostbite, to have another toe amputated or some other complications. So we often keep patients much longer than we're actually getting paid for what, by the government, for example, because they'll just come back. So we have a revolving door sometimes. We can't keep them forever, and we can't regulate their behavior once they leave Denver Health. So that's another area where we're somewhat unique. We will keep patients longer than many other hospitals because there's a moral distress factor, we'll call it, for some of our physicians who are dealing with these types of patients every day. If I'm not mistaken, you've gone so far as to set up like apartment style situations so that they're not necessarily on like a care floor, but they're in a safe place because you guys know that a great way to keep somebody who's unhoused from needing constant medical care is to get them housing. Or exactly, shelter. exactly. So we actually have 29 uh, apartment units. They're all transitional, so up to 90 days. And so that circumstance that I described to you around the person with frostbite, that might be a perfect candidate to move into this transitional housing. And we work with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, as well as the Denver Housing Authority, to facilitate a longer term solution to their housing needs. So the financial stuff is complicated, but suffice to say, the vast majority of your funding comes from the city of Denver, as opposed to the state, other than the federal dollars that, that you get in. You asked the city of Denver for more money. They said no. So here's my question. Does the Johnston administration's kind of sole focus on solving homelessness and the cost of the migrant crisis... Is that creating trickle-down effects elsewhere? Is that what you guys are dealing with, or do you see it as a separate part? Well, I think I see it uh, separate and apart. And I will say, um, you know, we've been disappointed, not just 
with the Johnston administration decision for our budget for this year. But I can partly understand it, you know, new in office, worrying about a lot of other priorities. But it's been th since 2006 that Denver Health's been getting the same amount of money from the city. Obviously, since 2006, wages have gone up, the cost of drugs, the cost of other things have gone up. So we've had to go to other sources to try to find that money. But a lot of the money, as you said, that comes from the federal government is also fixed. It's dictated by the administration in Washington. Um, I've had a number of conversations with the mayor, and I know he gets it, that the relationship between taking care of the unhoused and what Denver Health can do, it's, it's, you can't separate it. Because many of the unhoused, not all, have mental health and substance use disorder problems. We're really the largest provider in the state when it comes to substance use and mental health. Um, in our inpatient settings and in our clinics. So if we want those individuals to stay housed for a longer period of time and hopefully be productive, we've got to deal with some of the root causes that are part of their health care. If somebody comes into Denver Health from Lakewood or Venezuela, you know, you're going to treat them. Venezuela is not going to send you a check. Should Lakewood be sending you a check? I think that's a great question. About a third of our patients do come from outside the city and county of Denver. Um, some of it's adjacency. You know, Lakewood is adjacent. We've got a clinic, for example, in Sloan's Lake. Some people come across the county border. Um, in the past, we've actually sent a bill to those counties, uh, Arapahoe, Adams, and Jefferson. Um, we didn't really get a check back, uh, but I do think it's part of an important conversation that I've actually been having with the Polis administration. And hence, we did get $6 million from the state of Colorado for 2024. We're hopeful we'll get another five. That was a one-time payment. Uh, the governor does have in his budget another five for 2024. Um, but that's only a portion of the out-of-county out of uh, people that do come to us. Um, if they come through our emergency room, we're required to take care of them. And many of them, if they have Medicaid, they can come to Denver Health. And um, we like to believe that our care and our linguistic and cultural competency is one of the reasons why patients come to us. If things continue as they are, what's going to have to give? I think what's going to have to give is um, services, which I think is unfortunate. Um, right now, and you may have heard this, we have uh, 78 mental health and substance use disorder beds inpatient at Denver Health. It, as I said, it's the largest complement of inpatient beds. We don't have them all open because for each bed, we lose money right now based on the reimbursement that we get. We clearly could fill up those beds and take care of a lot of people that need those services. So I think service cuts are a potential. Um, we've deferred some maintenance uh, at Denver Health, um, not core patient services, but you know we had a flood. Like I'm sure a lot of other people had a flood the last couple of days with the pipes, but we had a flood in uh, our main hospital and had to shut down a few more beds because they were impacted by the flood. So I've got to be able to pay our employees what they deserve to keep them working at Denver Health in the face of some of these complicated patients. Um, but we also have to maintain our facilities to make it first class health care for everybody who deserves it. Is there an argument to be made that just like a lot of organizations, like a lot of not for profits that are trying to do more with less, that instead the reality is simply that you will have to do less with less, that maybe Denver Health has overextended itself and that if this is what the funding pot looks like, you are going to have to reorganize what you do. Yeah, I think the consequences are, though, the, that's the important conversation to have. Um, we're in 19 schools. I think a lot of people aren't aware of that. They think of Denver Health as this hospital and emergency room on 6th and Bannock. But we're in 10 communities. We're in 19 high schools. We provide such an essential service. I would argue that the consequences of Denver Health cutting back would mean um, that the city's uh, own economic vitality would be compromised, that young people wouldn't be graduating from high school, either because they're young girls that get pregnant, uh, kids who are vaping at a very young age. We provide 
um, mental health and substance use services in each of those 19 schools, reproductive counseling, as well as immunization. So I like to think, and it maybe goes back to your question about the mayor, is that we're integral to the success of the city overall. Is there any world in which Denver Health could shift, become more like the other hospital systems that, based on my rudimentary understanding, involves spending ungodly amounts of money on advertising, on Nine News, and on billboards and <laughs> elsewhere to convince people with a lot of money and insurance that if you're going to go get a new hip, that you want to go get it at such and such a hospital? Is there any way for Denver Health to pivot into that market to make money? I think, I think you will see us do a little bit of that. But again, it's a resource issue. If we're worried about a flood in one of our buildings, you know, the trade-off is do we fix that immediately or do we put it into marketing? Um, but I think part of what I've been talking to the media about and elected officials about is understanding how critical Denver Health is. The care is extraordinary. Um, I could, I could, if I wasn't going to commit a HIPAA violation, I could tell you lots of very famous and well-known people that come to Denver Health for their care who we've taken care of in our emergency room um, because it's a level one, one of the highest quality trauma centers um, in the country. Um, but we need to invest. We really need to invest in our infrastructure in order to be a first class institution. And we need to invest in the people. I mean, remember, um, people in healthcare were battered by COVID in terms of the demands put on them. And, Patients have become a little more difficult lately, and violence in not just Denver Health, but across hospital institutions in the United States is becoming an issue. People, are, people whether they're the patients or family members, um, aren't always grateful, and that makes the job even harder. So we need to do more to invest in our people as well as our, our spaces. But we'll get to Nine News with some advertising. I'm not asking for your dollars. <laughs> That's a different department around here. Let's finish with a practical question. Mm -hmm. Um, you've worked both in politics and outside politics. You were lieutenant governor here in Colorado. If Denver Health was able to get what it needed behind closed doors, you wouldn't be on a media blitz talking to reporters about what you need. Whose minds are you hoping to change and what outcome do you think is reasonable? Mm -hmm. I think I'm hoping to change every citizen in the state of Colorado because as I said, we serve 62 of 64 counties. The core of our services are, they're all in Denver, but many patients come here because of the quality of the care, as I said, the cultural competency and some of the services that are unique. You know, some people in rural areas don't have access to the services that we have. So I certainly want people to understand the breadth and the quality of what we do. Um, and lawmakers. So yes, if you're a legislator in Weld County, you need to understand that some of your residents are coming here to Denver Health for care and that there's a broader responsibility that elected officials, uh, state, county, and city have to help us deal with what I think is a, is a near crisis regarding health care. Donna Lynn, CEO of Denver Health, thank you for the conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Nice to see you, Kyle. Good to see you.